everyone. I, Dr. Poonam Joshi, welcome you all uh, to our Head and Neck Act Track Academic Program. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Prashant Pawar. Uh, Dr. Prashant is a close friend and a colleague, uh, uh, and uh, he is presently a senior consultant in Department of Head Neck Surgical Oncology uh, at SCG Kolaba, Mumbai. Mm -hmm. And he will be taking the lecture uh, on the topic, uh, minimally invasive uh, neck dissection, uh, the robotic or uh, endoscopic assisted neck dissection, the various indications and challenges. Uh, with this, we welcome Dr. Prashant Pawar for today's class. Uh, please go ahead with your presentation, Dr. Prashant. Thank you, Dr. Poonam. Can you hear me, Poonam? Yeah, I can hear you. I think volume is okay. Uh, hello. You have muted yourself, Dr. Prashant. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Poonam, can not you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but not very well audible. I don't know if it is okay with everyone. Can I share my screen now? Your screen is not visible, Prashant. Please uh, share the, your slides. Yeah, just a minute, huh? Okay, I don't have access, I think. Uh, you will have. IT people, I think you have you to give me? the access, please. Hello? Can you share your screen, Prashant? Yeah, I'm trying to. Just give me a minute. This filter. So right now, I'm not getting access here. Can okay, the IT I will ask again. Me? Yeah, yeah. You can put your this uh, ID and password you have put uh, Prashant into that. Yes, Sometimes yes, that's it will not give you access. Yeah, yeah. IT, can one of you please speak regarding the issue? Hello. Hello. Rupal, you are there. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Just one yeah. second. IT services, yeah. yes. yes. Please yes, give access yes, to uh, Dr. Prashant. Any issue? Issue from your side, IT. We can see your chat. Hello. Please give access to Dr. Prashant. Okay. I think now you can uh, do it. Fine. Oh, I, told, I still can't see it. Uh, they have made you co-host. Okay. I just try it again. Just give me Should a minute. Should be able to do it now. Yeah. Okay. Can you guide me? I think I, I still can't. Hello. Yes, Poonam. Ha ha, Prashant. So um, I think there will be this share slide. There will be this option. Na, you what, what your laptop, you'll have to open your half, open the PPT. Yeah, yeah. One second. One second. Yeah. I'm just trying to do that. Give me a minute. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, one second. IT, can you please help? Yeah, one yeah. Of you I, I got it. I got it. Started it coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah. We can see it now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So sorry for the delay. Okay. So as you can see, you know, from the Joker, we learned that you know scars are serious. And scars are a serious issue. Now, uh, so why are we so concerned about scars? Okay. So there was a nice paper. This is about the scars of thyroid surgery. 
and you can see that you know we all expect a good linear scar and most of us do get a linear good uh, flat scar in thyroidectomy but uh, many a times you know as you can see from this vancouver scale uh, grading sometimes you can get a linear bulging scar sometimes you, you can get a hypertrophy scar and at times you can get a retracted scar so the scar healing is never predictable and the findings on quality of life have suggested that uh, it impacts the patient's quality of life as much as chronic skin diseases like psoriasis, vitiligo, or severe atopic dermatitis. So especially from the patient perspective, it's an important issue. And uh, this is also a nice study looking at, uh, you know, objective, objectively about social attention on scars. And they compared a group of transoral thyroid surgery with trans uh, uh, cervical neck uh, uh, thyroid surgery. And they showed how, you know, our attention is always focused on the scars. And that uh, definitely impacts on patient's quality of life. So coming to our topic of today's discussion, we all know that oral cancer is the most common uh, cancer in India. Uh, today, elective neck dissection is a standard practice. Conventional incision is a large incision which leaves an undesirable scar in the neck and can seriously impact patient's appearance and psychology. And therefore, minimizing uh, uh, the cosmetic problems of the patient is one of the key issues. We have all learned about various incisions in neck dissection and conventional uh, incision like a Kreis incision, of course, gives undesirable scars. I think today, almost all of us are using horizontal skin crease incisions. And as you, as you can see in this picture, just modifying from the horizontal limb of the crease to a horizontal skin crease incision and avoiding that extension into the submental or the mastoid region also gives us better cosmetic outcomes. And as you can see, most of the patients, if you do that, you get good outcomes. But like we saw in the Vancouver scale grading, you are not always, you know, you cannot always predict the kind of healing that you can get. So that is why the best way to give the most cosmetic outcome to a patient is to have a hidden scar. Okay. And that is where uh, is our topic of discussion today, which is robotic neck dissection and endoscope or endoscope assisted neck dissection. Uh, we all know robotic uh, is today a very fancy thing. And it has evolved over a period of time. Uh, it is interesting to know that it was first developed, you know, uh, by uh, scientists from NASA and Stanford. They were trying to develop a telepresence yeah. surgical system to improve dexterity in microscopic hand surgery. Then the U.S. military got uh, interested and they wanted to develop a technology which can help wounded soldiers in the battlefield, which could be, you know, the operation could be done by remotely by the doctors. But that did not go further. And the first prototype actually was from Singapore, which was called a Eurobot, and was primarily for posterectomies. And gradually it has evolved. And in 1997, we had the first Da Vinci surgical system, which was released. And the first FD approval was in 2000 for laparoscopic surgeries. So what are the advantages of robot? Improved dexterity, high definition, 3D visualization, elimination of physiological tremors, and the potential to overcome the limitations of human hands as well as laparoscopic instruments. So we come to our topic of head and neck. What is the robot, uh, you know, helping us? How is it helping us? And uh, historically, if you look at it, was first developed for thyroidectomy. Uh, so the first uh, total thyroidectomy and central compartment neck dissection was described by authors from Korea. And uh, coming to neck dissection per se, because, you know, papillary thyroid cancers frequently metastasize to neck. So the first paper was by Dr. Kang and colleagues from Korea, Yonsei University, and they showed how a total thyroidectomy can be done along with a lateral neck dissection, and that was in 2010. But, uh, you know, the first uh, description was for transaxillary, and they were doing transaxillary total thyroidectomy along with lateral neck dissection. And thereafter, Dr. David Terrace and all popularized the facelift incision, which is more popular today, for robotic thyroidectomy and demonstrating improved operative time compared to the transaxillary technique. Uh, Dr. Kim and all, they showed how facelift can be combined with transaxillary. And thereafter, there were multiple studies from Korea, especially, showing the safety, feasibility of transaxillary, retroauricular, as well as modified facelift approaches. Now, the retroauricular neck dissection per se and the technique that is popular today was first described by Professor Kim, uh, Dr. Ko from Yonsei University, Korea. And this was followed by various authors from Yonsei University. And uh, I'll just like to highlight what is retroauricular incision and modified face shift incision. So both this incision are a part of the retroauricular approach that we use. So the approach is retroauricular. And the incision, the only difference you see in retroauricular incision, we go below and behind the pinna and then turn around the master tip into the hairline. And modified facelift incision, there is an extension to the preauricular sulcus 
either you could go into sulcus or you could go behind the tragus, but it additionally gives us more space to work with. So the advantages with robot initial way were obvious cosmetic benefit and the only major disadvantage was longer surgical time. So retroarchal approach, now we see how it was used for transaxillary as well as other approaches, but retroarchal approach became popular because it's a familiar territory to head neck surgeons. It is closer to the critical structures. Your distance to the important structures is less, allows intraoperative palpation, minimal scarring and completely hidden scar. Now, now we come to endoscope assisted uh, approaches and why did this come uh, into, uh, into practice? Because robot with the cost of infrastructure training and learning curve, that is really prohibitory. By contrast, if you look at endoscope assisted surgeries, the infrastructure is readily available. It is easier to learn and definitely is cost effective for the patient as well. So now we look at how endoscope assisted neck dissections have evolved. Now, endoscopic was evolved first and parathyrectomy was done by Gagner and colleagues in 1996. And then there was description of retroarchal approach for submandibular gland dissection with endoscope in 2010. And the first paper on endoscopic neck dissection was by Bayoun and all in 2014. Now, let's look at the first paper by Bayoun and all. And this is how, uh, you know, everybody's uh, uh, surgery evolves. This is the first paper showing six cases where majority of five of them were oral cancer per orally resectable T1, T2 oral cancers. They were all selective neck dissection performed for a clinically N0 neck. And if you look at the approach of neck dissection, so out of uh, five, you know, they have done five or uh, four patients, they have done a modified face shape approach, which tells you that initially, you know, you need a larger incision, which gives you more room to work with and makes your life easier. And this is what I was talking about. And see the amount of access that you get you know, this is open camera pictures and you can already see that, you know, how good an access you get to perform a selective neck dissection, especially for level one, two and three. This is really, uh, you know, very accessible. And uh, their initial experience was also they have described how initially it should take longer time from the first case to the sixth case. You know, the time has reduced almost 50 percent. Uh, both direct uh, dissection under vision as well as endoscopic dissection. The time goes on decreasing and there were no significant complications noted. Uh, compared to the conventional neck dissection and the cosmetic benefit was, was there for everybody to see. Now, whenever we talk about technology today, we always talk about what is the level one evidence. And so we could look, go and look at the level one evidence. Sukato and colleagues have, you know, done a systematic review on meta-analysis on robotic versus conventional neck dissection. There were 11 studies that were uh, uh, studied and out of this, six were for uh, uh, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And... Uh, you know, what they uh, really showed us was that the only two factors where there was statistically significant difference was duration of surgery and the cosmetic outcomes. Apart from that, for all the parameters, it was absolutely comparable to the conventional neck dissection. And uh, again, we'll look, look at level one evidence for endoscopic neck dissection. Oh, no. Is there a problem? No, we can see. We can see. Okay, no. okay. Just a minute. I think I think my PowerPoint is a little bit hiding for me. Just give me a second. No problem. Please go. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this was a level one evidence on endoscope assisted neck dissection, and they said uh, uh, there were about uh, six studies, and uh, uh, three of them from India. One of them was our study, and it was shown that you know the results are comparable. Uh, for endoscopic as well as conventional neck dissection, there was absolutely no difference uh, except for the factor of increased duration of surgery. And of course, there's obvious cosmetic benefit. This study also showed that there was shorter uh, hospital stay, but uh, this is debatable. So what is the consensus for robotic and endoscopic neck dissection? Uh, so indications are treatment naive patients, biopsy proven T1 and T2 oral cancers, where the primary is resectable per orally, it should be a clinically N0 neck and patients should be keen and motivated for improved cosmetic outcomes and should also look at whether it's affordable as well. Uh, the affordability is not so much of a concern for uh, endoscope assisted, but definitely for a robot. And what are the absolute contraindications? There should be no history of prior chemo, chemo radiation. There should, it should not be a recurrent case. It shouldn't be a clinically N plus. As of now, we do not have evidence of safety and feasibility for uh, these approaches for a clinically N plus neck. 
And if the primary resection involves excision of skin or requires cervical access, then obviously we're not going to do it. And there should be no history of any neck surgery in the past. So uh, I think if time permits, uh, I can show uh, a video. Poonam, do we have time for it? Yeah, yes, please go ahead, Prashant. Sure, sure. We will. Yeah. So I'll just show you quickly a retroauricular neck dissection video and a robotic neck dissection video as well. So this is what uh, me and my colleagues do. This is a retroauricular approach for a neck dissection. This was a, a early stage oral cavity cancer. This is used to be our setup initially with supine position, head turned towards the opposite side. We use an endoscope holder. Uh, initially, we're using it, but nowadays we are actually doing like an open surgery. I'll show you that as well later. So this is the incision. This is the modified facelift incision. It goes uh, periodical sulcus, then behind the pinna, and then into the hairline. This is the marking of the incision. Then, of course, we do infiltration with uh, lignocin and adrenaline. And then we start the incision and the flap raising. So initial flap raising is a little difficult because there is no landmark of platysma there. As we go posterior in the neck, the platysma is invisible. So you do a, 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 a flap raising like we do for a parotid. The first structure to be identified is the greater auricular nerve, followed by the external jugular vein. And once you've identified the external jugular vein, usually the platysma is within one centimeter of the external jugular vein. And once you've identified the platysma, the flap raising is absolutely similar to what you do for a conventional neck dissection. Okay. Only difference is that the extent of flap raising is slightly more than what you do for a conventional, meaning we'll be crossing the midline and the submental region and the midline will be going above the mandible. And you can see the axis is really there for everybody to see. I just quickly show you in a past video, you know, how we do. And uh, believe me, many times, you know, I'm actually just looking in the field and the endoscope is recording. So uh, not necessarily, uh, you cannot technically always call it an endoscope, but that's why we call it endoscope assisted. So it's only in 1A and 1B region where we have difficulty. That is where we use the endoscope assistance. But most of the surgery is actually an open surgery. So this is where we have done the level 3 and 4, uh, four now because this was C at tongue. Um, I prefer to do a 4 as well. Coming to level 2. So level 2, 3 and 4 are actually very easy because you have adequate access and is as good as the open surgery. It's only in 1A, 1B where it's Technically, a little challenging. That's why I'll take a little more time when I'm showing you the 1A and 1B dissection. I'll just quickly go through 2A and 2B. So again, you see 2A, 2B, very easy. So now we go to 1B. So before going to 1B, we'll show you 1A. So you see, you see the access again is adequate. You need longer retractors. You need a longer vascular forceps. And you can look at the cautery. It's a simple cautery, not even a long tip cautery. Okay. We're starting from ipsilateral digastric, going over the hyoid bone. We have to anticipate the submental branches and preemptively cauterize them to avoid bleeding. See how I'm cauterizing the submental branches. Okay. And make sure that the field remains clean. Otherwise, you know, in a bloody field, it becomes very difficult when you're working in a narrow access area. Okay. Then you go along the myeloid muscle onto the opposite digastric. And that's the completion of 1A. And after completion, you can see ipsilateral digastric, contralateral digastric. That's the adequate 1A dissection. Now we move on to 1B. Okay, because this is a tongue cancer, we would always identify the marginal mandibular nerve first. Okay. And after we have identified the nerve, then you stay away from the nerve. Okay. Make sure that you are away from the nerve, then gradually start dissection. The difference between this and the conventional neck dissection is basically uh, this is more of a posterior to anterior approach and inferior to superior approach. Okay. So you're working from the posterior because that is your axis. So this is how we begin. We begin from behind. We separate it from the parotid. Okay. And this patient, you can see the facial artery already. And this is where I say from inferior to superior and posterior to anterior. So I'm just raising this fascia going up to the digastric muscle there. Okay, now you can see the digastric muscle. And now we are going posteriorly identifying our facial artery. Okay, you can see the facial artery very well now. This patient had a slightly favorable anatomy. So what we did was we preserved the facial artery in continuity and we just clipped the submandibular branches. Okay, and now we are working along the lower border of the mandible. Yeah, so now we'll just clip that Submandibular branch. Yeah. 
So I use Liger clips, two clips on either side, and then we divide. Yeah. And now my assistant will just, you know, retract that artery posteriorly and I'll proceed dissection anteriorly. Okay, you see how my assistant is helping me by retracting the artery posteriorly. And now you go along the lower part of the mandible. Okay, and now this is very similar to what you do for conventional neck dissection. Go up to the anterior belly of digastric, work over the myeloid muscle. See how we are working? Yeah. Now, this is again posterior to anterior, inferior to superior. We are working from below the gland. Okay. And now, we will move from superior to inferior. Okay. Again, now, this is lingual nerve that has been identified. You see the ganglionic attachment. You divide the ganglionic attachment. Okay. Now, we will take all the fiber fatty tissue over the antibody of digastric and work posteriorly. Again, here you should anticipate your submental branches and make sure there's no bleeding. You could preemptively, you know, clip one of the branches. And the last structure that I divide is the submandibular duct because it's always in close relationship with the hypoglossal nerve. Okay. So we've come all around now. Yeah. Now we'll just divide the duct. Okay. So you have to lift very well so that you stay away from the hypoglossal nerve. And that's how you divide the duct. Okay. So that is your uh, complete neck dissection. And there's this marginal mandible nerve again showing this parallel resection of the tongue. This is the closure. In a, in a patient with a receding hairline, it may not be very obvious. But if you look at a young patient, you see how the cosmetic benefit is there to be seen. You actually have to make an effort to look at the incision by, you know, retracting the hairline. Okay. Again, compared with the conventional neck dissection, you can see there's obvious cosmetic benefit. This patient, we also did a marginal mandibulectomy per orally and we did a neck dissection. Now, can we do it without endoscopes? Our experience tells us that, you know, in patients where, you know, uh, the stature is small and distance between the mandible and the mastoid, right. yes, we can actually do it. You can see with the open camera, you can look right up to the one yeah, second, and we are able to do a, a neck dissection. We are going to publish this as well very soon that open surgery is also possible. And in women especially, long hair, it's very easy to hide the incision. Okay. And again, cosmetic benefit is always there to be seen. What do you, what do, you do if you need a microvascular free flap or reconstruction? Now, a radial artery forearm flap is very easily possible because the long pedicle is there and the access is adequate for us to do an anastomosis as well. So, if it is a per resectable primary and you need a FRAF, you can do it. What about PMMC? PMC is a workhorse in our head neck reconstruction. And this was a patient where we had done a partial glossectomy. We did a FRAF, but unfortunately FRAF failed. So in this situation, we did a salvage uh, PMMF. Okay. And just to show you that, you know, this incision is versatile. Even in a situation where the FRAF had failed and we had to do a PMMF. Okay. We didn't have to change the incision. We could do the same thing. The only thing because of two surgeries, there was a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, skin necrosis near the mastoid region. But a year down the line, you see the cosmetic benefit and uh, is really very, very nice. And some patients, for ethnic reasons, if they don't wish to shave, then you don't necessarily have to shave because our incision is far too posterior. Okay. The only complications that we have seen is, you know, uh, skin necrosis, especially if you go high onto the mastoid region. So try going, av uh, avoid going high into the mastoid region and you'll be fine. Another advantage that we see with these approaches is that the lymphedema is less because there's no horizontal incision in the neck. And uh, you can see marginal nerve also very well preserved. We've already seen the skin necrosis as a concern. And again, keloid formation is also a concern, uh, especially in the mastoid region. We have seen keloid uh, tendency in about 20% of the patients. Okay. Now, there's a small four-minute video of uh, robotic neck dissection as well. Now, this is usually the setup for robotic neck dissection. Uh, this is the patient table and uh, you see the there's a patient side cart with the arms. There's always one assistant at the head end which will be helping the primary surgeon who is sitting on the console. Uh, and the nurse is always on the left side and is at the leg end of the patient. Okay. And this is the usual setup. Uh, at least three arms are preferable. And this is a small uh, video by Professor Ko 
this is uh, readily available and this was provided to us as a part of the course that we did and this is level 1a dissection being done so there is there is a maryland forcep which is used as a forcep like we use a, a vascular or a tooth forcep to hold the tissues and this is what we call as a blade or the cautery and the maryland can also also be used as a bipolar and the third arm is basically the endoscope which is in the center So this is 1A dissection going over the myeloid muscle. Now we are starting with the 1B dissection. Okay. Again, this is inferior to superior. Okay. So as you can appreciate, this is the anterior of digastric. Okay. Now he is going superiorly. The only thing with robotic, you know, you need to have more access. So you have to create a wide field so that your arms, you know, have adequate space to work with. Now, this is the proximal end of the facial artery. They're using uh, special uh, vascular clips. You can also use Liga clips that we, uh, like we showed. And this is usually done by the assistant. Okay. So you see the instrument is also different and the assistant at the head end of the patient is using the applying the clips now the vessel is divided and then you proceed okay the gland is being lifted using the maryland forcep and the cautery is used to dissect okay you can appreciate you know the high definition uh, the video quality and 3d visualization is very helpful Especially when you sit in the console, it's as if you are operating uh, right at the patient side. Now they are uh, applying a clip to the duct and now the gland is coming off. Okay. So I'll just make it a short video only showing you 1A and 1B for want of time. And we discuss a few other things. Okay. See how they are using it for dissection and just like we use our uh, cautery uh, tip. Okay. Yeah. That's the, on the left side is the Maryland forcep and the right is the cautery. Okay. This is working at the posterior belly of the digastric now. Okay, you can see each and every fiber and slowly dissect. That's the advantage with the robot. The only problem with the robot is that, you know, the haptic feedback is not there. So when you are uh, doing any surgery or even for an endoscope assisted, you know, you're able to use your fingers, palpate, like, uh, you know, landmarks like mandible lower border. Okay. So uh, that feedback is lost because, you know, you can't really palpate uh, from the surgeon's console. So that's the completion of 1A, 1B dissection. Yeah. So there's another interesting paper published uh, by Dr. Akshay Khudbaja and all. We had shown that, you know, for 1A dissection, you could uh, do a trans-oral approach as well. So this is how a robot uh, Da Vinci system has evolved over a period of time. You can see that the, from the Da Vinci standard way back in 2000 to the Da Vinci XI, which is the latest model. And what is the future? A single port is, of course, already in practice. And what is the advantage with single port? As you can see from this picture here, see what happens when you use the uh, Da Vinci SI or XI is that there is this field where you're working and there are three arms. So what happens is that in a narrow space, if you have three arms, sometimes initially in your learning curve, there's a lot of clattering of the instruments that happens. But when you're using the single port, the instruments are already arranged in a parallel fashion and they open up at the tip. That's why this problem is not there when you're using a single port system. And of course, there are more and more robots coming in now. There's a snake robot from London. Med Robotic System has already developed a flex system, uh, which is already in uh, use as well. Then, of course, Johnson Johnson and Google are developing a robot 
finally, I would say that, you know, improve cosmetic outcomes is the most important advantage of this approach. Infrastructure and expertise is obviously needed. Longer duration of surgery. Uh, uh, this is again proven by both the meta-analysis. You should choose your patients judiciously. And a good surgical technique is must. Whether you're doing a conventional neck dissection or you're, especially if you're doing a robotic or endoscopic, you should be very well versed with your open surgery first. And then you could go on to robotic or endoscope assisted neck dissection. You should train yourself more and more and uh, do more and more cases that will help you get over the learning curve. And you should team up with your colleagues right from the training to practice. That really helps. And this is this is what I want to show. You know, for the endoscope assisted neck dissection, but again, uh, it is just uh, as a joke, you know, robot has its own advantages. So there is no debate about that. And uh, uh, for patients who cannot afford, endoscope assisted neck dissection is a very nice, feasible and viable option. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prashant. Wonderful lecture. Uh, quite a comprehensive one on both the techniques. One question I just wanted to ask for uh, benefit of uh, students that uh, like you said, there is a learning curve. What do you suggest? Like, I know there is no uh, such magic number, but can yeah. you just say that how many necks a student should be confident with I think, that he can I, go ahead and do an endo-assisted or robotic neck dissection? So, uh, so the, when you compare the two, there's a two, two different uh, systems already. So, uh, I would say that, you know, for an endoscope-assisted neck dissection, uh, it is slightly easier to get over the learning curve, okay? Because the instrument that we use for an ENT surgeon who is already trained with endoscopic surgery, it is slightly easier. Uh, the uh, access is also adequate. Like I told you, for level 2, 3 and 4, it's, it's actually like an open surgery. We don't even use the endoscope. So only for 1A and 1B is where you use the endoscope assistance. And there also, you know, it's the assistant who is holding the endoscope. It's not like your regular ENT surgery where you're using the endoscope is also you are holding. So it's more like the four-handed technique. So it's slightly easier to get over. Uh, but for a robot, it's a completely new technology, a new instrumentation altogether. Though. So I think it takes more time, more of a learning curve for us to uh, use a robot. But again, I would say, uh, is very well versed with at least 100 conventional neck dissections and then you go on with your endoscope assisted and then probably the robot and for any surgery i think 20 surgeries is the uh, is at least the minimum you know for us to train uh, to be able to do your own and again for that reason you know if you are working in an institution where they already have a robot and you have mentors who train you that's always a better idea and uh, when you also you know the the company itself provides for training so with da vinci they have a program where they they will refer you to a center where uh, uh, the program also includes a cadaveric neck dissection uh, as well as TORS uh, dissection courses. So you first train with a cadaver and then you go back to your institution where you work with your mentors and get a little bit of hands-on and then you can start doing your own. Correct. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. Uh, okay, one question. I think uh, why do we need to do like this robotic? What do you think is uh, actually has advantage over the endo assisted? Because we saw in your uh, presentation also that most of the time the incision is the same, the complication yes. more or less are the same. So, do you really think there is any advantage of robotic over endo assisted? And you said the learning curve would be even lesser with endo assisted. What is your thought on that? So I think I think we should just uh, you know there are just two technologies that are available. Okay, I think in today's world, whatever technology is coming up, we should get acquainted and we should be well uh, aware of how to use the technology. Now it's not necessary. It's it could be you know it could be an individual choice. Okay, if you're it at your institute, you are regularly using the robot and you're familiar with the robot, then maybe robot is your choice. But, you know, at places where robot is not available or even if it's available, sometimes, you know, uh, using the robot itself will increase the cost of the procedure by two lakhs. And many times the cost is also prohibitory. And that is where, you know, knowing the endoscope assisted is very important so that you can give the same cosmetic benefit to the patient without having to worry about the cost. So I think in today's date, it's important for us to know both the techniques. Okay. And uh, I wouldn't say one is superior to the other. But yes, I think uh, the the ease is much more with the robot. Uh, but you know, over time, when you get acquainted with the endoscope assisted, and you're actually doing like like an open surgery, it's much faster. 
so uh, with the robot what happens you now with the docking of instruments it takes time so at least half an hour uh, for the docking and then everything so robot yes uh, you know uh, with the terms of dissection quality recording and everything it's much better but if you want a faster technique with the same result and low cost i think endoscopic assisted neck dissection is the choice <laughs> Yes, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Prashant, there are a few questions on the chat box from the uh, from the attendees. If keloid formation rate is twenty percent, how would we call it a better cosmosis? I think because that the, was yes, uh -huh. yes. So because because the uh, scar is hidden in the hairline. Okay, so even if there's keloid formation now, see many times you know the keloid formation is not particularly because of the technique or the uh, area. Whether you do robotic or endoscopic, the keloid tend in a, a patient would always can be there okay but that is where i would say you now the same patient had done a conventional neck dissection the keloid scar would be in the neck okay so it's much better if you do it a retroarticular uh, incision and these patient even with the keloids they don't have any complaints because the scar is completely hidden correct uh, there is where, when level 2 comes positive on frozen how do you deal with level 5 dissection with retroauricular approach so, uh, so uh, my policy is not to do uh, frozen. I do uh, uh, like for uh, uh, for clinically T1 and T2. I think there is enough evidence to show that level 1 to uh, 4 is a comprehensive neck dissection. And there is no need to do a level 5. No, I mean, I think the question is, if can, like how easy is to access the level 5? So, I uh, so, level uh, okay. five so, so that, way, that way, I think level 5 is the easiest to do. Okay. Yeah. So if you have to do it, so in my personal, uh, uh, you know, the thought process is that you know, uh, over a period of time in the coming years, there will be developing evidence where we'll show that you know, even a comprehensive neck dissection is easily possible. Okay. So there is no difficulty in doing a level five whatsoever. I think the most difficult level to do is one A. Okay. All the other levels are actually relatively easier. Correct. So, what is the cost of any? Uh, you have uh, this. Can you tell us robotic neck dissection in a private hospital? So, robotic neck dissection, you know, it will add uh, about two lakh rupees to the patient's bill. So, if you are doing a conventional neck dissection versus a robotic, additional cost of the robot is about uh, anywhere from one point five to two lakhs. Correct. What endoscope do you use uh, while doing the your endo assisted uh, neck dissections? So I'm using the same uh, standard uh, zero degree stores equipment that we use. Okay, it's no different from what you do for your endoscopic uh, sinus surgery. And the only difference I, I'll tell you the special equipment that I'm using. One is that using I'm using a Thompson self retaining system to keep my flaps and retracted. And the other thing I'm using is I'm using special customized retractors with uh, suction and illumination port, which I have customized with uh, Kalilical Surgicals. And they are available with the surgicals as well. And it is it is kind of mimicking what you, the FK retractors that you use for the robotic surgery. Yes. So, uh, is there any difference in the length of the incision? I think you already explained that uh, in the robotic versus retroauricular endoscopic assisted procedure. So, the instrumentation is completely different for both of them. But uh, as you can see, for endoscopic assisted neck dissection, I show you the video. I'm using a regular instrument. Now, for a patient who has a small stage... Incision. Can... Prashant, incision. 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 Length, length incision. of incision. So, yes. definitely for an endoscope-assisted neck dissection, we are using a modified facelift incision, okay, which has a preauricular extension. So, definitely the incision is longer. And uh, because of the robot, no, the instrumentation, we are able to do it uh, purely retroauricular. So, the incision is... Uh, the preauricular extension is not there. That's the only difference. And, uh, you know, believe me, uh, everybody, you know, very many times you come across patients who have a short stature with a broad neck uh, it, or even sometimes long neck. If it's difficult, you no, know, many times what you do is that uh, posteriorly be in the hairline, you can curve and go behind. Okay. And you make your incision longer to improve the access. And whenever you're struggling. So if you're struggling in level three and four, you go more posteriorly along the hairline and inferiorly. And if you're struggling in one A, one B, then you, of course, you take the preauricular extension. Okay. But uh, majority of the robotic surgery, they use purely retroauricular and uh, which is because it's slightly easier with the robot and endo assisted, we always use the preauricular extension. Yes. And what are the tips for preserving the spinal accessory nerve while doing robotic neck section? 
I think uh, it is the same. Uh, uh, the I, I would recommend you know that the marginal nerve identification and preserving should be done like a open technique, okay, and uh, not with robot because you know because that would mean that you are using the cautery to dissect and uh, you know identify the nerve. So I would recommend that you know identification of the marginal mandibular nerve and dissection uh, near the nerve should be done by the open surgical technique, which is you know uh, which we showed how it can be easily done. And believe me, majority of the surgeons, even when they are doing robotic, they are doing level 2, 3, 4 as an open surgery. And then they are docking and everything is done only for 1A and 1B. Correct. So, like, a lot of parts of the neck can be uh, even accessed easily by the retroauricular approach. In fact, there is a publication already showing, you know, how the entire neck dissection, selective neck dissection at least, can be done as an open surgery using the modified space safe incision and we are also in the process of publishing our experience with the same okay sure without that. without use of robot and without use of endoscope right i think that concern regarding the cost of uh, this robotic still remains at least in india with our poor patients i think that Absolutely. will be a great uh, this addition to the literature as well as to our surgical uh, procedures uh, once you publish that so with this, if there are no more questions, we would conclude today's lecture. I once again thank you, Dr. Prashant. Uh, and uh, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just show you the slide, you know, the outcomes of facial incision approach without okay. endoscope or robot. So this sure. literature is already there. So this is facial lip incision approach, yes, without the endoscope or robot. Without endoscope yes. or robot also, we are able to do a neck dissection. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Poonam, for inviting me and yeah, having thank you over. It's an absolute privilege to be, you know, uh, participating in any activity with our uh, alumni. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you.
అవును ఏదో పెళ్లికి వెళ్తున్నాను అనిపించి కార్ ఉంది కదా మేడం లగ్జరీ ఆమె కారణం వీళ్ళని అడుగుతుందా Thank you. 